So we are in Nefesh Chaim. We had actually just started chapter four. So let's do a very quick recap. The first three chapters focus on what does it mean to be in the image of God and why do we specifically use the name Elohim when we talk about being in the image of God and Tzalem Elohim. And the answer is because Elohim, the name means Balakaychus Kulam, that which is in charge of all forces and powers. So you see lots of things with forces and powers, human, natural, supernatural. When you relate them all to the source, that's the name Elohim. Why are we in the image of that? Because Hashem runs the world according to our actions. So it's like all the powers tie into this point, which Hashem is in complete control of, but the rules He chooses to operate everything under is what do we do? We do good. Positive energy flows through the system. Chastral and we do something not good. Blockages, damage, right? Um, of all the light and godliness flowing into the system. And it can even be precisely aligned. So if there was literally one human being in the world, you could probably see exact parallels, exact cause and effect. Obviously, there's lots of humans, so lots of things going on. And we started the fourth chapter um, last time, where he said that a person should be very clear in their heart that all the details of everything they do, every moment, is never lost. And nobody should ever think, what difference do my actions make right now? Does it really matter if I do something good where no one can see? Does it really make a difference what mood I'm in? Does it really make a difference if I put on tefillin? Does it really make a difference if, if whatever it is, every single mitzvah, right? So we're on gate four. Gate, no, no, gate one, chapter four. About four paragraphs down. Now, um, we're just going to run through the main text, not the Hagar, not the little foot, not the footnote, which is an important one. We saw the Zostaris Adam. This is the Torah of the human being. And we spoke a bit about that phrase last time. No one should ever say, Kimani, what am I? Makoichi was my power. How can me, little me, sitting in the middle of wherever it is in London and something, how can I impact the world? Right? Omnom, however, Yovin, now this was even more of a question in the age before social media and before you could post something that at least others could see, you know. But um, you're in a village somewhere and there's five of you and five families. That, well, what are you doing exactly that's impacting the world? But it's true today as well. Easy for, and on many levels, this is the little voice inside that says we're a load of rubbish, we make no difference. Right, one of the most demoralizing voices that we have. <coughs> Omnom, however, Yovin, the Yeda, person should know and, and, and uh, really understand and know the Yikob Mashavosliboy and fix we again spoke specifically about these terms. Oh here do you want to take uh, take a copy of the safer? Shalom of Alex. Nice to see you. So um we're in chapter uh, uh, yeah Sharala first gates chapter four Perik Dalad um if you can fix into the heart Every, not every action, speech, and thought, but every detail of every action, speech, and thought. Kali Saraga, and every single moment, and we discussed in the past how long, what each moment is, and there's a new flow of positive energy into the world, etc. Opportunity every moment. is never, ever lost. How incredible is, is the action of each human. Every single one can rise up according to its root. Every action. Not every person, every single action. Lifel Pulasa to do what it does. The Gavim Romim and the greatest heights by Lamas in the world, with Taftoche, Sairus, Elionim, the flashes of the upper lights. Over MS, and in truth, I'm skipping out the Hagar, the footnote that we did last time. A person who really gets this clear, have a certain level of trembling, right? It's something awesome when you. When you realize the awesomeness of, of this, there's also responsibility comes with it. Mm-hmm. The person thinks, what if I do negative acts? One little thing, one thing wrong could do immense damage. More than Nebuchadnezzar and Titus did. Why Nebuchadnezzar and Titus? Because they're the two who destroyed the temple, destroyed the base of Mekdosh. Now, what well, this is so this an awesome concept. It's Halo Nevuchadnezzar of Titus, Nevuchadnezzar and Titus, Loi Osim Maseim, didn't achieve in their actions Shum Pagam Bekilko Klalaman. And they did huge things down on this world. They destroyed the temple, the base of Mikdash. They killed lots and lots of people. They destroyed Jerusalem, Rayushalayim. But they only dealt with this world. They didn't deal with anything above this world. They do not have the power to impact anything above. Nothing was happening above. Right? The power of having the responsibility of, of Torah in the world is 
right? By having the nation that's, that's meant to be keeping Torah is plugged into an incredibly high place, right? National activities are generally at a lower level, but if you're tapped into the meaning of existence, then you're tapped into an incredibly deep place that, so they can't touch these things. That's why we don't blame them for destroying the base and destroying the temple. We're not anti-Roman or anti-Babylonian, right? What do we blame? We look into ourselves and we say, that the Jewish people themselves had caused contamination into the upper equivalent of the base image of the temple. And through that, then that, in other words, weakened the spiritual root, the inner core dimension that is expressed in God's house in this world. Okay? And through that, then the natural consequence is it's now like a house of cards ready to collapse. And it magnifies and draws in an enemy who's ready to destroy it. What does that mean? Does that mean a non-Jew doesn't... Sorry, a non-Jew doesn't have, I don't know, like, kind of a theory of able to do that we can? No. So, so that's not what it means. People Jewish and non-Jewish have free will. And have, that's, otherwise, how could someone not-Jewish have a portion of the world to come? Right. Heading so that involved. No. First of all, we're not talking here about doing mitzvahs, right? The Shavah mitzvahs, B'nai Noach, the seven Archad laws, they also touch somewhere. We're talking here about pure physical activities and people not doing mitzvahs, right? We're talking about, uh, and we're talking about national, for also national forces have far less free will than individual forces. Uh, God's manipulating history, driving history. So certain things have to happen. So, so does that mean that now the Gemara says Titus is punished? So he himself does things wrong, right? But it may not be, um, but we don't hold him as the primary source of responsibility. What did he do wrong? Maybe the extra arrogance he brought to it, the extra cruelty he brought to it. But the principle that the root primary source of destruction of the house of God of, is us, is on us. So he's not saying that, I don't know, if let's say Titus would have nothing to do with it, just gone and murdered the baby, he wouldn't get punished that. No, no, no. The reason why the best thing yeah. is yeah, because just, of us. Of course, the whole Torah is full of reward and punishment for all human beings, right? How does Sodom get destroyed exactly? Mm. Right? You don't even need the Torah. And in fact, this is a discussion in, in one of the Akdamas of Shas, is that you might not well, you might not even need the Torah itself to be given in order, how does Saddam get destroyed? Because it didn't do kindness. Who told them that to do kindness? It wasn't part of the Noahide law. You don't even need kindness. It's, it's an innate part of, of human beings to know that cruelty is a bad thing. So yes, lots and lots of generations of people get punished. Punishment and reward can exist across the board. Um, but here we're talking about the conquering drive, let's say, in these nations, and to specifically the drive to then come to Jerusalem to cause that, that's not, was not in their hands. That was happening in our hands. The, the, if you like, the deepest driving point in the world and where the world is subconsciously driven and plugged into is always going to be Kalisov. Because that's the epicenter in when we accepted the Torah at Sinai. So all humans have choices that impact in some way, spiritually speaking, right? But the, what we chose to do which was a huge responsibility to take on when we stood at Ara Sinai and said to Hashem, Nasa Vinishma, we're going to do what you say and we're going, to, we're going to then follow and understand it. That moment was a choice to say you're plugging into a place where the, the power of those actions on national level and even on an individual level, he's saying it, are immense. They're, they are now central to what's happening in the world. So although we believe every nation has a purpose in the world, Right? It's like building the vessel that house God's light, if you like. We've, our job is actually bring that light in. Um, and yes, you can have Hasidim with Olam in the non-Jewish world to also do that. But the, the fundamental thing is Israel. The fundamental channel through which God's light will permeate ultimately to all of mankind is us. And when we magnify that correctly, we bring a bracha not just to ourselves, but to the whole world. And if Hashanah, we, we get it wrong, we bring darkness into the whole place, into the whole world. And so if we, push, as it were, in our actions, push Hashem out of his world, then the result of that is that the place where we have the house of God is gone. And maybe our, our ability to live in the land of Israel is gone and so on. So all of these elements are fundamentally in our hands. Meaning, let's put it slightly differently. If we would have been properly attached to Hashem at that time, no Babylonian army either would have come into the land or could have come into the land. No Roman army could have come in or would have come into the land no base image would have been destroyed. And you see it, you had superpowers, you had Sancherev get right up to the gates of Jerusalem, right, the superpower of his time, at the right time the Jewish people did Teshuva, and they, he couldn't do anything. His army just marched out, you've even got in the British Museum his own version of this crazy event that happened, right? Where he didn't actually destroy Jerusalem, he didn't destroy Yerushalayim. 
got his write-up of it. It's found in the British Museum. But, um, but whereas then, centuries later, oh, nothing can happen. And Yermio, right, Yanovi is telling them, excuse me, this can go very, very wrong. It's up to your spiritual level. It's not, you know, it's not Hashem just looks after the city and that's it. That is, so you're now, so in that, from that perspective, you're sitting at the, ep- the epicenter of things. That's really what he's saying. So how does that apply individually? It's quite a hard one to like bridge that. How much can we do collectively oh. on a high level? So what we understand is that every individual action taps into a very high level. Now you're right, and this is always a balance in all of these. That's why you look at one safer than another. Each, each work you look at will emphasize a different point. The most important relationship that exists is a national relationship with God, right? It's, that's true. Um, but there's also an individual relationship, and that's very much emphasized in Kabbalistic works. So you'll see it in Hasidic texts, you'll see it in the non-Hasidic texts, is whatever happens is true on a national level is also to some degree true on every individual level too, right? And it was around this time, let's say in the 50 to 100 years around when this safe is being written, that this began to be taught all over. You see it in lots of Hasidic works, you see it in, in the Vilna Gans teaching, you see it all over this principle that whatever's true nationally, will also be true for the individual to a large degree. And therefore, that's, and that's why we're created separately. We could be just one big consciousness and that's it, right? Uh, we all just have one thing called Yisrael. But no, we're meant to be individuated because each one of us has a unique role, unique purpose. And we're meant to say to ourselves, and this is always the voice, the voice in our head that says, as we said last time, and he's saying here, the voice that says, I don't make a difference is the worst voice you can have. It's a very common voice. It sits inside every single one of our heads on some level and says, I don't matter. And that's the voice that says, it's not worth me coming. Does it matter if I come five minutes early or five minutes late to davening or five minutes early, five minutes late to, to shir, to learning Torah or stay five minutes early? It doesn't matter, right? Because I don't matter. Because what I'm really going to remember the whole of Shas. I'm not going to be one of the great Talmud, I'm not, not going to be one of the great, great ones alive. Does my charity matter if I can give 20 pounds or not give 20 pounds? There's millionaires who can write the check and do the whole thing, right? Does it matter if I, you know, does my, all these things. And what he's saying here is it all matters. You don't even know how it matters. The efforts should be focused on that sort of improving that national relationship somehow if you can. Of course, of course that's critical. Of course that's key. Of course, because you say, Kali Solar Ravens, that everyone's all within Jewish people, everyone's responsible for one another, which means even literally in halacha, you can make a broth on somebody else's mitzvah. But if you're about to eat an apple, I can't make a blessing. I can't make a broth for you unless I'm also eating it because it's your benefit. But if you're about to do a mitzvah, you're about to put tefillin on, you don't know the blessing, you don't know the broth, I can make it for you because it's also, we're all plugged into one another. And it's the, it's the wholeness of, of Israel as a whole that has that relationship with Hashem. Nevertheless, and that's why we're also responsible for one another and we've got to care for one another and help one another and each try and help each other to be better. But at the same time, and, and even that, and that itself is, is fulfilling. You see, the very act of then caring and trying to impact somebody else or is itself then touches things incredibly high places, 100%. You see, that itself, the, the myth is what does Hashem want me to do right now? The impact of it is infinite, right? That is, is what, it, it's, it's beyond the conscious level of what we can possibly comprehend. And, yeah. I'm still not understanding this problem. It starts off by saying that even if one small little tiny virus, I don't know, let's yeah. say not saying a problem before you eat something, yeah. is much worse than what Titus did destroying everything. Yes. Is that because... We destroyed it before he got there by our spirit. Yes, back. yes. What Titus did when he came and through the base of Mikdash was, it's like he came and took away the outer layer. Right? It, it's right. like... Because we had like, beforehand... Right, it's like the if there's thing. rot going through a finger all the way, all the way, all the way, then some guy can come along and pull it and it comes straight off. But that fella didn't pull off the rot and the thing, all the stuff going on inside ripped the whole thing away, right? Then it became, like if you chop a building from the inside and tear it down, and there's now tiny paper thing and some guy comes and knocks it down, You've done the main damage, not that person. Right? That's what's going on. There's always somebody waiting to come and knock the last bit down, if you like. But, there's, uh, but you can't knock it down if the building's strong and standing. That's what he's saying, yeah. Is that <coughs> actions that touch the inner dimension of reality are vastly more powerful than the actions that only touch the outer layer of reality. Now, if the, if the action the outer layer of reality is a mitzvah, that, that's, the, that's a whole different story. You see, if, and Hashem instructs us all the time to do outer layers of things that, that mimic the behavior of the outer world. So a doctor saving somebody's life is, is an infinite mitzvah, right? Obviously that touches the outer, but it touches the inner and, you know, or, or, or whatever it may be, right? So there's plenty of giving 
stock or charity. You can see how it works in the natural world. And most things that work in the deep supernatural world will also have a corollary of working in this natural world too. I'll give you an example. I think I gave it last week. Like you work on being holy in a certain challenge and you didn't even notice. So it touches the inner dimensions of the world, even though no one ever sees it. But it will also change you as a person, which means it will change some action you'll do in the next 24 hours, which will then change the way other people see you, which will, even on subconscious layers, people will be impacting people across the whole world in levels we can't imagine. So this will usually translate into the natural world as well. But he's saying, even in theory, if it wouldn't, right? Because otherwise the Rambam, the Rambam says in the, in the, the ninth chapter of, of Hilchus Shuvah, the laws of repentance, he says, so, you know, what difference does it make if, if uh, now why do we need reward in this world if the only thing that matters really is our eternity, right? And how the end of history goes. And he says, because this world gives you the tools you need to do more. Because say, so who cares? I could, if I'm sitting in a, in a prison or I'm sitting in an app, if I can give charity or not, right? Who cares? I can do mitzvahs. The answer is yes, but there's certain, the mitzvahs, there's a relationship between the mitzvahs in the physical world and what they're doing in the inner world too. There is a reality to the impact you can have on people is the most ideal way to serve Hashem. Right? That's why every time there's a mitzvah, let's say learning Torah, which you're going to speak about, teaching Torah, we know is the greatest mitzvah there is, right? Teaching Torah, Talmud Torah. But even he's going to say learning Torah, which is less so less clear than the Gemara, because even that has the same, to some degree, same level. So why is it that every time you're learning Torah or even teaching Torah, especially learning Torah, and there's a mitzvah that no one else can do, you've got to go and do it? It's not fair, right? So there's lots of different answers to this question. But in principle, the whole point of learning Torah is to inculcate the brain to be tuned into the godly way of thinking, right? And teaching Torah is the gift they actually give that to others. That really, you learn to teach. But even if we just have it ourselves, but you got to do it, right? That's the whole point. Every time, the, the whole point is that, that, that Hashem wants it drawn down into the lowest world, into this world. And we'll touch by it. All these issues which I'm just mapping out now are issues that are going to now thicken out and develop much more as we travel through this safer. So we're laying a little groundwork, but like uh, this sort of thing, we could keep revisiting, 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 and lots of these points will become clearer and clearer and clearer as we go through. Okay? Any more questions on this so far? Let's go weiter. Let's go further. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar only destroyed the outer dimension. They didn't do anything in the inner dimension, right? It was through our sins, we blocked the natural flow of light, love, godliness, coming from Hashem himself into the world through all the different layers that we spoke about last week. Contaminated, as it were, the higher and inner Temple by the day, and through that, and that's how they were able to destroy this world down here. Hamachuvan, which is really a, it's it's literally Namachuvan this in Alofa that it's aligned with the upper temple, but it means literally, in other words, if the upper one's blocked, then the lower one is going to be destroyed sooner or later. If no military force had been around, then it would have to have an earthquake, or you know, but if we're going to be exiled, then some military force can have to come and do it. Kamosha Om Razal, like the Medrash says, Kimcha Tachina Tachinas. You ground something that was always you ground, right? You, Titus, you came along and thought you're such a great conqueror. You destroyed something that was already destroyed. The temple was already destroyed. It was a physical outer layer of a fundamentally destroyed thing that now just has to be. Somebody has to come along and fire some battering rams, fire some whatever they're called, uh, catapults, and bring us some battering rams and so on. That, that's, you know. Harry Mala, because it was our sins that wrecked and destroyed this upper level. The inner worlds and layers of reality. And they finished off the outer layer. This is why King David prays he davens in, in Psalms and Tilim 74. He says, Right? Right? What is he saying? Because he, he's, he was asking, he was talking to those who destroyed down here. The enemy destroyed, say, Hashem should consider it as if they destroyed something really deep in the, in the higher worlds. You see what King David said? He's saying, when they do damage down here to us, may it be seen as sinful as if they did the real damage in the higher worlds. So what he's alluding to is, then, and as he presumably saw the cruelty, but right, he's, he's asking it should be as if they did the damage in the inner world. But it's not as if they did. It's not actually naturally like that. They didn't really do it at all. So the first trembling is to recognize how powerful and impactful our choices can actually be. Now, this is not to be disempowered by this. You see, certainly in our generation, one needs to be a little careful 
people can just say, oh gosh, so that means I'm terrible because I do this wrong and that wrong and the other wrong. That's not usually, I mean, that empowers a person, fantastic. If it, the goal here is to be more motivated to do good, right? And as we understand, none of us are perfectly close to Hashem, but every step we take in the right direction is worth the whole of existence. Right? People often say something like, since I'm never going to learn the whole of Gemara, so should I bother learning one page? And the answer is, don't think of learning the whole, what's just learn one page? It's going to build universes, right? And this is the whole idea of, of every step we take is itself worth the whole of creation. That's the point he's getting across over here. So it doesn't matter who we think we are. We're much, much, much greater than we think we are. That's really the, our greater potential. Okay, now, and also, this should also now make us tremble. Who Now listen to this. Within our structure of our physical and mental apparatus is some replica of kol hakoiches velamos kulam of every single one of all the worlds, right, including all the way up to the name of Hashem Himself. Okay. Now we're going to get there in two chapters time. We're going to explain this. He's just jumped a little glimpse ahead, a little flash of lightning to light up our, our life over here. So you've got, let's say, this entire spiritual system with all its layers and all its avenues and everything going on. And wired into every single one is, every single part of this is wired into each one of us. That's the power of this. Unbelievable. Right? So, um, and we're going to get later on in Shah Base, and the second gateway deals much more with, with davening, what, what, what tefillah, what prayer is. Parakeim, what it means to bless Hashem. Shein heima kodesh hamikdash aliyan. That includes the base hamikdash, the highest one. It includes the holy of holies, the highest spiritual version of all this. Ba'alev shel adam em tzayis de gufa, and the heart of the human, the center of their reality. The kolalis I call that, that encapsulates everything. Negative base culture, because that's the bit that's opposite the Holy of Holies. M. Tsayishuf, the center of all creation, Evan Shasiyah, the foundation rock. Kolo Kol Shashim Akar Kedushas Kamayu, which includes, so there's a little bit of our, the epicenter of our being, and he'll clarify this more in later chapters exactly how this works. But the epicenter of our being includes a point that is wired in to the center of all reality, to the holiest point of all reality. And that's the hint that we have in this Mishnah. Which is actually a halacha, a law in all davening. When a person davens, the amida, the sign of prayer, in the Shemun what they are supposed to do is line their heart up with the Holy of Holies. So, on a simple level, it means we imagine that we're sitting inside the base of Mikdash, we're in the temple there, and we're in the Holy of Holies, right? and that's where, that's where we're, right? Physically, you're also meant to aim your body as well. It's a separate halacha, separate uh, the next Simon Shulchanar. But, you meant to also physically align yourself. So if you're outside Israel, towards Israel, if you're in Israel, towards Yerushalayim, towards Jerusalem, if you're there, towards where the base of Mikdash is, if, you're, if you were in the base, towards the Holy Holies. But you do it also before that, you do it in your heart too. But the reason you do it in your heart is that's not like a nice, you know, prepares your mind in a good medit meditative state, which it really is as well, right? You should literally shut your eyes and imagine walking to the Holy of Holies and standing for Hashem. But as well as that, there is a reality happening that we're activating at that moment the deep part of us that is at one, literally plugged in to the spiritual root of that place. It's an amazing, amazing thing. It's like when you, when you really think this for a moment before Shema Nesre, it's very hard to even bring the words out. We actually have to say, Hashem, Spasai Tiftoch, God, open my lips, Sophia, like, get it, it's like, well, what am I going to say here? You know, nah, nah. And, then, and then we understand, the rabbis are giving us the text, Baruch, Atom, Hashem, and we'll learn later on what these words mean, right? These are incredibly powerful things. But it's like, Wow, it's, it's almost like, it's, it's scary. It's like, I can actually do that. I can stand down. Yes, I, didn't, I don't think I'm worthy. It doesn't matter, Hashem says you are. Just stand there now and do that. And that is the incredible awesomeness of this. Remember, everything he's teaching in here is based on the Vilna Gaon's teachings of, of how to understand things in Kabbalah here. And he's always, whatever he's, he's revealing, he's also concealing a lot as well. And, and really, ideally, we'd look up all these sources and see exactly where he's extrapolating from them. Tahazi, so this is go and see. This in Aramaic now, the Zoya. Kutcha brichu baranash ba'alma. So when I, uh, sorry, so, yeah, sorry, kadbra kutcha brichu baranash ba'alma. When, when the creator of the universe created man in the world, iskin lake gabnei la yakira. He fixed him like a structure of the inner worlds. We have lay a chele, so he gave him, um, 
powers for Tukve Bem Tzadikul for the special extra dimension of energy in the center of his body. The Salman Shailibo, that's where the, the heart is. Kigavna Daiskin, and later on he says, Gavna Daiskin, Kishabitha Alma, a similar point when, when uh, uh, this Hashem fixed the world. Um, the Ovid Lake had Gufo, he made one body, etc. And again, the heart in the center, quoting all these things. And there the Zayah literally says, the place of the Holy of Holies, the Salman Shekhin of Akaparis, the Kruvim Aron, exactly just like in the physical world, you would literally have Hashem's presence sitting there together with the Ark and with the, with the, with the Kruvim. And he's going to talk about them all later on, by the way, as well. Again, when he's throwing things in here, he's also giving you hints of where he's going to go. He's going to literally have chapters discussing specifically why that to these kruvim, these cherubs, these, these uh, uh, body-like things inside the Holy of Holies. What are these things? What do they do? What do they mean? And why that in the inner part of our heart, they're supposed to be there too, right? So a lot of these, if you ever learn the Tanya, it's even more like this, where he seems to meander on a side point and actually he's giving a glimpse of where you're going to be later on. Right, so Nefesh Chaim doesn't, he has a different style of writing. It's not got the same long meandering flow. The tiny is kind of a long poetry. Here it's a different type of poetry. But he's also, he's throwing that example out here, but actually he's, he's giving you, he's going to go into it later on in a chapter that will seem to be unrelated to this one. And so these, these, because really these works, they're trying to tap us into a dimension of thinking where no one thread by itself works. You get a bit here and then a bit here and a bit here, and suddenly the picture starts to move into focus. Right, it's like um, I don't know what it's like. <laughs> but it's uh, it's well, I guess it's like you can't describe to a blind person what this room is like, but just like you can just by switching the lights on. So you have to move bit by bit by bit by bit, slowly, slowly, slowly. If you're in the dark, you have to slowly get a picture. So that's what he's doing. But um, okay, but Hecha Makarais goes to Kadoshim, and the this uh, is around the Holy of Holies, Shisham Shkhin of Kaparis, the Kruvimara, etc. Fine, yes. Okay, sorry, yeah. I just remember. Im Kain, if so, Be'esha Shah Yosu Adam Nachsha Bilvaba, Machshava Shah Loita, Rabbani of Ratsa Rachon Islam. So now think what it is when we have negative thoughts, bad thoughts, right? Impure thoughts. Hayu Machnes Zaina Semana Kina, Be'es Kotcha Kadoshim, Ayyan. So here he's talking about a person who has an adulterous thought, let's say. So they should understand that there's something deeply problematic about that. Right, by Lomas Eliano Kadoshim of Hashanah. At that moment, our mind is meant to be a pure place, ideally. And again, people should be very careful not to overbeat themselves up on this stuff because we can't always control what comes to the mind. But in the long run of life, we can get better and better and better and make our mind more and more naturally think of purer and holier things. And that should be a life ambition to become holier and purer people. Okay, because all the stuff that's going on in our mind, right, is having big, uh, big impacts on things. Okay, and again, if We've had lots of experiences of certain things. So there'll be thoughts that flash to our mind, but what, that's why some, usually tr taming the mind is, is a long-term project, not a short-term project. But let's, where we can occupy our mind with holy things, more and more and more we should do it, right? And more and more and more, we should try and remove ourselves from the sorts of things that naturally stimulate um, things that are inappropriate to be thinking about, right? And he specifically brings the example of, of a zoina, of a prostitute, which is, he uses there, he says, that's actually of, of jealousy, fascinating. You wouldn't have thought that's an issue of, of jealousy in particular. But the, the deep, subtle root of it is the real root that blocks God out of our mind is our desire to control things, be kind of own things, which is the root of jealousy. And in that world where we're constantly trying to be in control, a natural place the mind jumps to um, all the time is things that are very tempting. And when we're in a world where we can let go more, and let Hashem's light guide us more and more and more, which is, again, a level to be working on all our lives. But it's about, fascinatingly enough, not trying to, to uh, over-control stuff in the world. Then there's a natural, much more place, right? One of the most important, if, you, if one person wants to work on their middles, on their attributes and character traits, the single one that has the biggest impact usually on all the others is Betach and is trusting God. And trusting God doesn't just mean I trust God will do things that I want to do. I'd like to make money this year. Hashem will deliver it all to me. Trusting Hashem means I trust whatever position he puts me in is the right one to be in. And that takes the stresses of life and the fears of life and the need to control the world away. We get very active, right? If Hashem says to us, you need to raise money for a hospital right now, off you go and do it, right? If Hashem says to us, I need to spend a bit more time learning Torah now, I'll go and do it. If Hashem says I need to now, you know, bring five more people and learn together with them, I'll go and do that, whatever it is. But it's, it's being letting Hashem guide us 
that allows the mind to be filled with that. When we're trying to control, we dominate our own mind and then it jumps into all sorts of exciting places that temporarily stimulate us, all kinds of things like that. And yes, our negative thoughts can touch the high, high world. All more, much more than that. Titus, bad seers, zayin of beis kodesh kadosh, and make this matter. And the reason he brings that analogy is one of the things Titus did was bring a harlot into the temple. So, however horrific that was, right? A person who deliberately spends their life wanting to dream about things like that is uh, is leading uh, is is doing in some ways worse than Titus did, right? And again. Part of the struggles of being a young male in the world is sometimes there'll be thoughts flash into the head. A person shouldn't, one, one of these you've got to be careful and you don't say that this is that then spend the next three years, say, oh, I'm rubbish, Hashem hates me, I'm terrible, blah, blah, blah. No, but what we've got to try and do is move is where we can dedicate our mind to holy things, where we have a, something we can do that will allow for less of the impure things. Then we should make the efforts. We should, we take them very, very seriously, the efforts in these sorts of areas. Okay. That's the thing. I think there's always the wrong way to learn this and the right way to learn it. Okay, we're not here to say that we're evil, horrific people if an idea flashes into our mind or whatever. What we can't control, we can't control. But we are here to say that what we can control, we we got to control. And, and more than that, in our long run, the more we fill the mind with beautiful thoughts and good thoughts and Hashem thoughts and holy thoughts, and the more we... Sometimes that directly fighting these things head on is actually the wrong way to go about it. But becoming over time more and more pure and working on whatever we can work on, then each one of those things, each time we do put a pure thought in, it's like we just cleared out an enormous amount of, uh, we just added holiness into the Holy of Holies. That's the way to think about this. So always, you know you're thinking the right way when it motivates you to want to do more. You know you're thinking the wrong way when it motivates you to want to do less. Right, that's, that's the general rule. The same with any... Any thought of doing something wrong, it can be a fiber cast, let's say anger, a shower, tivus rice, or any other temptations we have. God should save us from this, right? This is what God says to Yechazkel, as Makoim Kisi, the place of my throne. Oh. I dwell there amongst the Jewish people. The Jewish people will not anymore uh, contaminate my holy house. There's no some with their adultery. Again, same principle. When they're, when they're able to remove this negative, then my place uh, moves into the world. I'm going to skip this for now. We'll come back to Mir Hashem next week. If we're learning together next week, we'll have to see what we're up to next week. I would just jump. And this is now what the verse of the past says. Hashem God formed man dust from the ground. Breathed into him the soul of life. Man became a living soul. But look what the simple interpretation is exactly in the translation. The, the Targum, the translation there, by the way, says, Man, have you got where it is? Right near the end of chapter four. Should be. Yeah, you got it? Man became a speaking spirit, right? By having the power of speech, we created the power to envision a universe that's different to ours, communicate it to others, and collectively work together. And that's the soul of life. When a person was just a body alone, just having a body, it was just an inanimate thing. When God put the soul, became a mo- okay, uh, something as motion as speech. Iron Ramban, look at the Ramban. He's going to come back to all this again later. Omnom, but he, listen now very carefully. So he says, listen. Let's listen carefully to the words. He bought It doesn't say there was within the human being the soul of life. Well, there was within the human being the ability to have speech. The human himself was the soul of life. What does that mean? Normally you say we have within us a soul. He's saying, no, no, no. The verse, if you listen carefully, it says the man is the soul of life. So there's a place also, and he's always very careful to write this. The simple meaning is the correct meaning because that always fixes the meaning to allow you to go deeper. But there's also space to hear a deeper idea. Because we, on the simple level, we've got a soul within us, and he'll discuss this at length, many chapters discussing this. That makes us into the soul of all of creation. Just like 
every detail of what you move consciously in your body is through the types of layers of consciousness and spirituality and everything within us. So to the human is the operating system, the consciousness and the intentionality, who, like the consciousness and intentionality, whose actions are driving all these worlds. Now, I've already put it in a way that he's going to clarify is not precise. Right? Next chapter is going to say, well, uh, well, actually two chapters. We're going to, next few chapters... Um, I'm going to start to align and make this more precise. But in some sense, the human is to creation, right? The Adam is to creation, the Israel is to creation, like um, the soul is to the body. If you took the soul and all parts of the mind, let's say, completely out of the body, it would just slump and be a dead and dying thing. But you put it inside and it's this animate thing that can do all this stuff, right? That's the relationship we have to the world's. It's the decisions made in the conscious layers and subconscious layers that make the body do everything it does and make it into something useful that can be a vessel for all things in the world. So too, the decisions we're making and things we're doing are switching on and off this entire infrastructure of all of creation. Okay, next we're going to have to come and do that. I've got to do this whole beautiful piece he's got on, on what the base of Mikdash is or whatever he is. We'll have to get there. Is you were saying that a lot of the, a lot of temptation, a lot of evil, tomorrow, like evil inclination in general, comes from a place of controlling, or specifically this area. Um, so I think in general, a lot of what temptation is is some form of an inner drug. A lot, we want to have certain feelings, and the drive for that inner drug is typically associated with certain frustrations and painful situations we're in. Now, a person who's completely trusting Hashem can be in painful situations, but they're not suffering in the same way that means I need to take this drug, right? And that's where, whereas the person who's trying to control the world around them is always frustrated, always fearful, always in a situation of it's not working the way I want it to be, or if it is, it might not tomorrow, right? And that place is a very difficult place to live, and so we have to medicate ourselves in all sorts of different techniques that we use to do it. Right? Sometimes it manifests as anger. Right? That also feels momentarily good. Sometimes it manifests itself as temptation. Sometimes it manifests itself in, in all sorts of ways. But we need stimulated feelings to cover the challenge. In other words, the human is really programmed to have a complete trusting relationship with God. The human, when they can't trust God, is left in a very, very dark, miserable, or very stressful place. Because the thing they've got to trust in instead are things they can try and control. And everything becomes about trying to control something on all sorts of levels. Is that specifically for someone who's more the controlling type? Well, that's his struggle. That's their struggle. Or is it, because like, I, I, can, I can see why temptation could be something that comes from a controlling place. But he links it seven that, like, right? It could just be temptation. It could just be like, the evil inclination could just be temptation. Yeah, yeah. There's no question. A person, a person, even a person is very, well, first of all, people it's are not very, to be, well, non-controlling can also be a way to try and contempt. There's many ways to try and control an environment around us. One is to be the domineering personality. Right, makes right, that's the, true. One is to try and be that really sweet fellow who others do what they want them to do. There's many, many different ways we use to try to get the world around us to swivel around us, to, and to be it, oh, we're the central axis around where it wants to go. Right? We even try to sometimes, we have this idea we can manipulate Hashem to do the things we want too. And there is a small aspect of at least turning to Hashem puts him in the center. But as he's going to say later on when he gets to davening, really the ideal way to daven to Hashem is not to be asking Hashem to be serving us, which is often what we're trying to do. Or can I do this? And if I give this stock, is Hashem going to do what I want, right? It's to get into the mindset more and more of what does Hashem want for me? How can I magnify His presence in the world, right? It's a very, it's a much deeper mindset to try to get into. But it's accessible to all of us. It's a little switch that we need to basically try and make every single day. But this type of switch of recognizing, once, once we recognize what we are, it almost becomes so very great people will say to us things like, you know, like, yeah, do you have any, like, we, we had the privilege to meet Rav Yitzhak Berk. It, it was like, it's so petty, it's beneath you to care about these sorts of things. Like you come to with a communal issue and politics here, and then everyone's like, oh, isn't it beneath you, you know, like uh, to care about this kind of stuff? You know, like, like, because there is a sense where, and you feel, yeah, that's on your grade level. We're humans, come on. And there's a truth to that too. We're all imperfect and humans. And that's, but there's another truth to, it's true, but we can 
train ourselves a little bit more to say, Hashem, you're in charge of the world, right? Not me, right? We'd say every Yom Kippur, we all say it. We can't do, anyway, these are all different pieces. It's a whole long puzzle which he's going to be, going to bring in.